Uh, this is what we do here. You can uh, feel free to continue asking questions. But what I do is we read the paper, we try to explain it, and then at the end we rate the paper. You can rate the paper, and uh, if you're in chat, we have an emote review. You type emotes into the chat with some specialty emotes, and then we review the paper. So this is is pregnancy a disease a normative approach by Anna Smador and Yuna Rasa Rasanen. Sorry, how I say your names? I'm dumb American. Um, and then the Journal of Medical Ethics. So. Okay, here we go. And as always, feel free to ask questions along the way. It's my first time reading it too. I will try to uh, explain as best I can. And here we go. <clears throat> Imagine a patient who visits the doctor having an abdom uh, abdominal mass that is increasing in size, causing pain, vomiting, and displacement of other internal organs. Tests are booked and investigations are planned. But when the patient mentions that she has missed her period, these alarming system, uh, symptoms suddenly become trivial. She is pregnant. No disease, nothing to worry about. But is this the right way of thinking about things? What counts as a disease is a recurring question in the philosophy of medicine. And this is true. What counts as sickness and health? I mean, think about it this way. If you're not talking about disease, you're talking about what is health. No one has a very good idea exactly what is the best life. This is the ancient question from Aristotle, Plato, and all of them. What is the best life? And so disease is just something, the negation of the best life. But that leaves a huge huge range of like uh, uh, possibilities for what counts as disease. And this has been around since the ancients. This is an ancient question. And when they say recurring question in the philosophy of medicine, they're not kidding. This is ancient level uh, philosophy. Uh, Viper says, in 1974, millions of homosexual sexuals were cured of a major psychological ailment overnight. Yeah, because at a certain point, homosexuality was treated as a medical problem, a psychological disease. And then all of a sudden, it was no longer a psychological disease. So in one, they were diseased, and then all of a sudden, they weren't. And so it's like, well, why was it classified medically as a disease? That was a political and medical decision that someone made. Is that a good way to be in society? I don't think it is, and we decided it wasn't. So, yeah. Okay. Experts disagree about the criteria by which we can distinguish diseases from other phenomena. Some believe that diseases can be defined with reference to some objective truth. Others that the term is purely or partially socially constructed. Whichever view one takes, it is difficult to find a theory that accommodates all those conditions we take intuitively to be diseases while excluding all those that intuitively we do not. We argue that there are several pragmatic reasons based on a combination of biological, social, and normative considerations to classify pregnancy as a disease. Okay. So, yeah, and so this is where I thought it was going. Classifying disease is difficult. I mean, any sort of like hard and fast classification being like, this is what a man is. Like a man is a featherless biped that was blown up by Diogenes in the classic story. And uh, like this is like, well, what is a disease? Is it just like some simple thing that we can define? Like Plato tried to define man and that didn't work out for Plato. That doesn't work out for people trying to define disease either nowadays harmful symptoms diseases are harmful they cause suffering and are bad for the health of the person who experiences them commonly though in a warrant in a wanted pregnancy we focus on the longed for child rather than whatever harms that the pregnancy a uh, pregnant woman may experience the risk of pregnancy may appear negligible or insignificant in this context uh does this apply to getting boy preggers i would assume so i mean why wouldn't it what does boy preggers have to do with anything, Aris, really? Like, what kind of stupid question is that? <laughs> the harms of pregnancy are often transient, and most pregnant women survive the experience. Fear of becoming pregnant is in itself regarded as a pathological condition. Uh, tokophobia. Well, that's a cool word. Tokophobia. Uh, fear of being pregnant. Wow, that's a cool name. I didn't know that one. That may require medical treatment. Pregnancy also has some medical benefits. Some uh, women who suffer from rheumatoid arthritis report improved symptoms during pregnancy. Interesting. Didn't know that. Carrying a pregnancy to term early in life can reduce the lifetime risk of breast cancer. Pregnancy, of course, has also has subjective benefits. We discuss these in our section on subjective value. Is motherhood communism? I mean, if you're talking about like the commune of the mother and the child in one life... 
Uh, I mean, communism is a political stance, really. Now, what do you exactly mean by communism? If you're talking about, like, uh, the politics of the pregnancy or motherhood itself, I mean, you know, it takes a village, Ivan. It takes a village to raise a child. So I would say, yes, it takes a, a commune to raise a child. Uh, yeah. You're going to have to send that to your boy necologist, yeah. You mean your proctologist? Um, what's it? DCI, you have to be more specific. Boy necology is a subset of all these other things, so careful there. Yeah. Okay, two questions emerge here. First, how do the risks of pregnancy compare with those of other conditions that are regarded as bona fide diseases? And second, are health risks themselves a sufficient basis on which to designate a condition of a disease as a disease? Is capitalism communism? Um, I mean, by definition, I think no, but that doesn't mean it can't be communistic or communish. Yeah. Uh, DCI, there was another paper we were going to read where we said, is science communist? And so we were just like, you know, shooting the shit about it that, you know, science is very communistic in sort of the sharing of knowledge and like the group, like, you know, scientists all working together to like a greater goal. It's not very individualistic. So the fact that we can just argue for anything in philosophy being communist is, uh, Ivan's poking a little fun at us that, you know, anything can be argued to be communist here and therefore reductio ad absurdum nothing is communism one god one market one truth one consumer yeah exactly so yeah it's like one man one truth <clears throat> okay in order to answer the first question so yeah is this like sufficient to designate pregnancy as a disease in order to answer the first question we can compare pregnancy with measles measles is uncontroversially regarded as a disease and treated as such by public health authorities and health professionals measles is harmful to nearly all those who catch it however most patients will survive very few will die and only a small por a proportion will go on to experience longer term impacts on their health so how do the risks of pregnancy compare to against those of measles like measles, pregnancy is a self-limiting condition. It follows a predictable trajectory that usually ends in the patient's recovery. Both pregnancy and measles also involve symptoms that can impair one's normal functioning, functional ability. DCI says, can we get a poll whether I can say vaginal without giggling or not? What was the poll about there, DCI? Uh, common symptoms experienced during pregnancy include back pain, bleeding, gums, headaches, heartburn, and indigestion, leaking from the nipples, nosebleeds, pelvic pain, piles, stomach pain, stretch marks, swollen ankles, feet and fingers, tiredness and sleep problems, thrush, vaginal bleeding, vaginal discharge, vomiting, mor morning sickness, and weight gain. I mean, should I start laughing when I say vaginal? Like, that would be the oddball thing, I guess. Like, hee hee, vaginal. Like many diseases, including measles, pregnancy is a condition that has distinct stages. The first stage of pregnancy commonly involves many of the symptoms described here. The second stage, labor, will usually involve extreme pain, powerful cramps, and the ripping, stretching, and damaging of tissue. This second stage is far riskier, riskier than the first in terms of long-term threats uh, and health. It is a funny word. Well, it, shouldn't, it probably shouldn't be, but it kind of is. What about mortality rates? Here we can compare the lifetime risk of dying from measles with the lifetime risk of dying from pregnancy-related harms. The WHO states a woman's lifetime risk of maternal health, maternal death, is the, pro is the probability that a 15-year-old woman will eventually die from a maternal cause. In high-income countries, it is 1 in 5,400 versus 1 in 45 in low-income countries. Yeah, hysterical. Which, of course, hysterical. I mean, that's from like, uh, uh, what's it called? Hysterectomy, the, uh, hist, the women re reproductive, uh, organs too. So, yip, yip, yip. <laughs> uh, hey, what's up, Tinderos? Thanks for the lurk. Appreciate it. The risk of dying, uh, should one catch measles about one in 5,000. Okay, so. You know, however, the lifetime risk of dying from measles is not simply one in five thousand. It is far less than this, far less than this, largely because of vaccination programs have diminished the likelihood of contracting measles during one's lifetime. Hysteria meant uterus in old timey Greek. Yeah. So again, we're just saying the same words. <laughs> and is hysteria a funny word? I don't know. 
the incidence of measles has diminished in the USA, for example, to less than one uh, per million. Of these one per million who contract measles, only one in 5,000 will die. Thus, the lifetime risk of dying from measles in a country with an effective vaccination program is one in 5,000 times one million. So that's five trillion, something like that. The same source notes that prior to vaccination, almost everyone would expect to be infected with measles at some point during their lifetime. In this case, the lifetime risk of dying from measles would be more or less identical with the 1 in 5,000 chance of dying should one catch measles, since catching it becomes almost a certainty. On this basis, the lifetime risk of dying from pregnancy-related causes is dramatically higher than the lifetime risk of dying from measles in countries with a vaccination program. This is true despite the fact that those countries are also likely to be the ones that have effective maternity health services. If we compare the risk of pregnancy in countries, countries without such services with the risk of measles, oh, excuse me. <coughs> If we compare the risk of pregnancy in countries without such services with the risk of measles in countries without vaccination programs, the picture is even starker. Thank you. The lifetime risk of dying in, a child, uh, in childbirth in low-income countries is 1 in 45, and the lifetime risk of dying from measles would approach 1 in 5,000. With or without effective health services, the lifetime risk of dying of childbirth significantly outweighs that of dying from measles. However, unlike measles, pregnancy is a condition that affects only a certain group of people, those with female reproductive organs. Perhaps this partially explains why the risk of inv risks involved in pregnancy are higher in places where women's rights and independence receive less social and legal protection. If medical services are not available, many pregnant people will be seriously injured as a result of second-stage pregnancy, and a significant number of them will die. The WHO states, quote, All women need access to high-quality care, provided competent, skilled health professionals during pregnancy. It is particularly important that all births are attended by skilled health professionals as timely management and treatment can make the difference between life and death. End quote. Uh, yes, these. May science protect us. Yes. However, many people do not regard pregnancy as a disease. Indeed, the idea that it might be thus construed is highly contentious. Pregnancy is not a disease despite its risks, then there must be some additional factor to take into account. One such consideration might be the degree to which the condition is valued. Pineapple? Is that supposed to make me not sneeze? I mean, I'm not sneezing. <laughs> Subjective value and the unwanted pregnancy. Yeah, so if you think pregnancy is a good, as opposed to measles, which no one wants measles, but people want kids, so there's a difference there. Subjective value and the unwanted pregnancy. Pregnancy is often a cause for celebration. It can give people's lives meaning as a source of intense fulfillment and profound significance for many individuals. Pregnant women are popularly said to be blooming. Nevertheless, as Iris Marion Young points out, those who are privileged enough to regard pregnancy as a choice are in a minority. For most of the world's inhabitants, there is nothing voluntary about pregnancy, and women may be very far from celebrating each pregnancy they experience. Unlike measles, pregnancy is a condition about which people may take a variety of views. One may be dismayed or overjoyed to be pregnant. These subjective responses might seem to disqualify pregnancy from being classified as a disease. Typically, people... Think of the classification of a disease as being an objective scientific endeavor, but some philosophers hold that it is primarily a matter of value. Rachel Cooper, for example, proposes that to be classified as a disease, a phenomena P must satisfy three conditions. These conditions are 1. P is bad for the person who suffers from it. 2. The sufferer is unlucky to suffer from P. And 3. P can be treated medically. Cooper notes that her approach could indicate that unwanted pregnancy counts as a disease. However, our aim is to establish whether pregnancy itself can be construed as such, irrespective of whether it is wanted. Here, therefore, we take a closer look at how, pregnant, how a wanted pregnancy might fare in regard to Cooper's three criteria above. Cooper's first condition requires that P is bad for the sufferer. Diseases may be bad for the sufferer in a variety of ways. Most obviously, they may cause pain and suffering, increase risk of long-term health complications, and shorten lifespans. Insofar as pregnancy also causes pain, suffering, etc., it seems that we may indeed say that it is bad for the person who experiences it. But do wanted pregnancies have these effects? A person who is happy to be pregnant may welcome even unpleasant symptoms such as stretch marks and nausea. 
the pain of childbirth may be treated as a badge of honor. Perhaps then, the badness component of pregnancy can simply be disregarded in such cases. If so, a wanted pregnancy is not a disease, whatever its impact on a person's health. However, for consistency, this might imply that other cases where a person finds value in their experience can no longer claim to have a disease. There is a wealth of qualitative research showing that sufferers often ascribe value to their experience of conditions that are uncontroversially regarded as being diseases such as cancer and heart disease. Yeah, so they think that cancer is a good thing for them? That's fucking weird, but okay. Viper says, looks around to ensure there are no women within earshot. Is feminism a disease? Well, I mean, it's a theory. Now, are theories bad for you? Possibly. Uh, could, could, can they call you harm? Definitely. Some theories do cause harm in society, which are like certain theories, like say you don't like communism and you think communism affects a, a society in a bad way that can cause you harm. So, I mean, it could be at the uh, a disease of society at the societal level, but uh, mostly I would doubt it. Because f most of the time, people like the reason they ascribe to femi feminism is because there are other problems in society. And so the reason that they think feminism has value is because there's problems in society they're trying to correct. Now, some people do bad theory, they're bad feminists, they're bad non feminists, bad anti feminists. I don't know the terms here, but like it would be a society level problem. So yeah. Kukla goes by Quill Kukla now, and they then pronouns. Yeah. That's true. We're, uh, what are you referencing there, Luke? I was like, yes. Were we talking about Kukla? Uh, Viper says a mimetic virus that overrides the genetic imperative. Yeah, but I mean, a lot of philosophies like that for that uh, point. What's up, Valpo? Yeah, I mean, I really like if you want to go by other pronouns or you want to change your name, like have at it. It doesn't matter to me. I If that makes you happy, I'm happy for you. It's like good. <sighs> yeah, so and uh Quill Kukla apparently had like a, a father who was also a father who was also a philosopher and had one of these crazy lives as well like it, so there was a thing on daily news just the news site we were there so you can look up like Kukla philosopher and he had like one of these lives where he went everywhere did all the things so um like yeah and i mean is the genetic imperative even a good thing vipers at this point i mean maybe there's too many people I mean, maybe we should be uh, cosmic uh, antinatalists where just we should be more worried about not getting our genes to go out into space because we're just evil things spent spreading evil. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> and Ivan has a point right there. Yeah, uh, also Twitch for that matter, because if you're watching me, you're not having sex right now. <laughs> At least I don't think any of you are, but it's entirely possible. Uh, Twitch. Okay. If we then conclude that for such people, their condition is no longer bad for them and thus that they do not have a disease. Yeah, if you think cancer is good for you, you're nuts. But then, yeah. This implies a very rigid and binary understanding of the relationship between subjective value and disease. People either value P in which, in case it is not a disease, or they do not evaluate it, evaluate it in, which, in which case it may be a disease. Yeah, we don't think that how we think about diseases is really what makes them diseases. That would be very subjective. Okay. Viper says, feminism also works in favor of the ruling class. The feminization of any professions such as teaching or office works has historically led a reduction in wages. And that's before we consider doubling the supply of workers. Yeah, like there's a huge number of problems there. Um, and there's like multiple waves of feminism. Like so if certain feminists were doing certain things, the second wave were doing that, then third wave. And apparently the different waves hate each other because, you know, again, like so some feminists were perfectly happy um, being like supporting women, but then they were crapping on like, you know, like other minorities. Like, uh, so if like you were African American woman, you didn't get to have the benefits of the white women in like the first wave of feminism. Don't kill me if I get the history wrong here. I'm just trying to give an example. So it's like, yeah, there's problems. That doesn't mean feminism on the whole. It's like all uh, theories of philosophy. Some things work, some things diff didn't. And so it's like, you got to, uh, it's like, you can't look at the, problems of the past feminism as saying oh yeah well all feminism is bad because current feminism well they know that too they're trying to fix this stuff yeah i know of uh, vipers perhaps watching is having sex for some values of having sex 
Yeah, again, I am not one of these error theorists. Like, I don't do stuff like that. I think uh, that would be a mistake if that's how you view the world. But, uh, I mean, okay. I mean, if that's how, if that makes you feel better, go right ahead. Luke says, sorry, just listen to me, uh, what I read. Misheard R. Cooper as R. Kukla. Okay, yeah, Cooper. Sorry. New York accent. I do the, yeah, I don't go the hard R's. So, you know, no hard R's in uh, New York accents. Yep. Kukla. Yeah, I'm not surprised it was... I'm not surprised Kukla got referenced, but I actually just hadn't seen it. I was like, did I miss something? Like, I was, like, legit asking. I, like, it may have been relevant. I just didn't know. Okay. So, in reality, of course, when we're talking about disease, uh, people's subjective beliefs and values are not fixed in this binary way. Therefore, if values play a role in classifying disease, we should not expect this to yield a neat, reliable distinction between what constitutes a disease and what does not. A more plausible way of accommodating value is to acknowledge that the experience of valuing some aspect of P does not necessarily conflict with P's badness for the sufferer in terms of the object of harms and risks outlined above. Accordingly, a wanted pregnancy may qualify as a disease on this interpretation. Cloud air? Cloud air is cloud ah. Yeah. But that's more Boston where they uh go like with just no R at all. Uh yeah. Okay. Moreover, it is worth emphasizing that pregnancy commonly causes far more risky and unpleasant symptoms than those we have listed above. The idea that pregnant women should regard pain, nausea, and stretch marks with joy may be understandable, but pregnancy frequently involves for far more serious risks. It is for this reason that the WHO, that's the World Health, or excuse me, World Health Organization, if anyone doesn't know, as noted above, emphasized that medical care makes the difference between life and death for birthing women. In a world in which misogyny and pronatalism pro continue to exercise powerful sway, it is not implausible that even serious risks and injuries may be viewed by pregnant and non-pregnant people alike as a mark of suitability for motherhood, a confirmation that the prospective mother is prepared to accept a suffering as her lot. Yeah, the World Health Organization, DCI, the WHO. Not Tommy's the WHO. Uh... Wow, Vipers, shooting down Ivan's dancing. That's just low. Yes, the band. That's exactly right. Because of this, we suggest that it is vital to think carefully about the social conditions that inform a patient's perception of P before endorsing too eagerly the idea that subjective value is what makes P a disease or not. Finally, it is worth noting that in the old days of medicine, many patients diagnosed with diseases such as homosexuality or immorality fully endorsed the idea that they were indeed sick, and these conditions were bad for them. Again, this calls into question the relationship between subjective perceptions and the designation of something as a disease. Vulnerable and disadvantaged social groups are often pressured to, in to categorize their experiences in ways that fit with social norms. Yeah, this is... You know, there's a big political thing here where it's like you have to you the way you view the world is how you also medicalize it. And so this is not good. It's like this is not just social. It's political and like money and power gets all. Ooh, dance off. That would be a good uh, stream uh, dance off stream. OK, where these categorizations result in. Uh, in further disadvantage or vulnerability, we should regard them with suspicion. We discuss this in more detail in our section on medical practice below. Cooper's third condition is that P can be treated medically. This condition is fully met by pregnancy, whether wanted or not. Where services are available, pregnancy is the focus of intense medical detection and attention and often intervention. Again, we discuss this further in our section on medical practice. We now turn to Cooper's more challenging second condition. Does it make sense to regard a wanted preg pregnancy as being unlucky for the pregnant person? As we have noted, many people regard themselves as fortunate when they become pregnant. But is this the end of the story? There are occasions where conditions are actively sought in circumstances where one might feel lucky to have caught them and where this does not intuitively challenge their disease status. Some common diseases, such as chicken pox and measles, used to be regarded in this way. To draw on a more recent example, many people who contracted the milder Omicron version of COVID-19 after having been fully vaccinated felt themselves fortunate to have done so. Another example might be that of courting disease in order to escape the draft. Yeah. 
Perhaps, though, we can still regard these sufferers as being unlucky to suffer from P. Oh, yeah, remember, bone spurs. That's how you get out of the draft. You got bone spurs in your foot. People were happy to get COVID. People hey, Rethios, how you doing? People were happy to get the mild version of COVID because also that also conferred some immunity for a while too. So imagine you got the mild version of COVID. You had like, you know, a day's worth of cold, then you were fine. And so that like prevented you from getting the nasty version for the next six months. So it's like, yeah, if I would take a very mild version of COVID and feel lucky that I didn't get the nasty version and then gave me a little bit of uh, immunity. No one was happy about it, but like you might consider some people were happy to get one version versus the other. So, yeah. <clears throat> oh, great. Went to a baseball game today and had the best seat in the house. Congratulations. And there were a lot of hecklers around. That's fun. That's fun. I mean, you know, baseball is a great sport. First of all, I like baseball, but like there's fun things you can do in the stand. You know, you get your, your beer and your hot dog or whatever, and, you're, and you can sit there and you yell at people. It's fun. Like depends where you are, too. <clears throat> okay yeah and again imagine you didn't want to go to vietnam and you uh you could get like um and you could get certain diseases that would prevent you from being uh you know recruited or whatever like that's something there just in slc with their triple a team the slcbs ah, that's fun yeah see that's Good times. Although I don't know if you can drink beer in SLC. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, so... Like, uh, I think my cu my uncle got out of NOM by, like, bullshitting something. Other people, you know, they had uh, the doctors write medical things for them. Yeah. They won, they won with loaded bases, walk in the 10th inning. Wow, and you can drink beer. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, you need beer for baseball. It's just... I mean, not everyone's, like, sitting there with a little piece of paper marking off every little thing that happens. It's like, you want to just, like, let it go. Like, chill out, drink a beer, and, like, watch him, like, hit a ball, like, 400 feet or whatever. Okay, perhaps, though, we can still regard these sufferers as being unlucky to suffer from pee, even though they have actively sought it. Yeah, so you can imagine you're unlucky for getting COVID, even though you wanted to get the mild form of COVID. Those who seek P in order to avoid the draft or, or some worse version of P are choosing what they believe to be the lesser of two evils. The sufferer could still be viewed as unlucky in one of two ways. First, insofar as they were in an invidious position and are obliged to choose between two unpleasant things, or second, because P is still bad, even in cases where it is less bad than the alternative. So how might this apply to the wanted pregnancy? We suggest that a wanted pregnancy can be seen at least in some cases as the lesser of two evils. In this case, the greater evil is childlessness. A woman might be lucky to become pregnant if she longs to become a mother and sees no other way to achieve this, but she is unlucky that pregnancy like COVID-19 and chickenpox is objectively threatening to her health, and she is unlucky to be in a position where pregnancy, with all its risks, appear to be her only route to motherhood. Yeah, so if you can't adopt and you can only get uh, pregnant, then you might feel bad about being pregnant, but like that's what you're going to do because you'd rather be a mother. Makes sense. It might be objected here that some women specify uh, want to experience. Some women specifically want to experience pregnancy as part of what is entailed by motherhood. They do not regard pregnancy as the lesser of two evils, but as a valuable experience in its own right. However, as long as pregnancy is the only route to reproduction for most women, it is difficult, if not impossible, to gauge the value of pregnancy in its own right. To push this further, one might consider how doctors or friends and family ought to respond to someone who became. Pregnant purely in order to experience pregnancy without any intention of parenting the child and independently of any additional motive, such as wanting to facilitate the parental wishes of others via surrogacy. We suggest that in such a case, a person's wish to become to be pregnant might seem pathological. Yeah, so that would be strange. You want to be pregnant, but you don't want the kids and you're not doing it for somebody else. That would be a little strange because it would be like wanting to be sick and something, putting yourself at risk. But yeah. If one accepts this, it follows that in many, perhaps most cases of wanted pregnancy, the sufferer is unlucky, unlucky insofar as she is obliged to undergo the associated risks in order to achieve the good she seeks. As suggested above, this does not conflict with the idea that she may nevertheless place significant value on her experience of pregnancy. Medical Practice 
Some philosophers suggest that disease is simply what is treated by such as by the medical community. Okay, so this is the institutional uh, theory of things. Like, whatever the doctors treat is what is disease. This account goes beyond Cooper's approach in which the possibility of treating P medically only indicates that P is a disease if her other criteria are also met. A purely relativist approach requires no additional criterion or justification. This is the same kind of argument as that we can identify art simply by observing what is treated as art in the art world. Yeah, so this is mostly used in art world stuff. Like, so what counts as art? Well, what's in museums is what art is. Easy. Um, and it's actually, it sounds stupid, but this is one of the uh, better theories. It's like, I'm not telling you what art is. I'm not telling you what pregnancy is. You defer to the experts. You defer to the, you know, museum curators, the artists, the people who make these decisions. They know what art is. In the same way, you defer to the doctors and the hospitals. They understand what a disease is. And so it's not as crazy. It's uh, just appeal to authority. And, you know, these are the authority who get to define what disease is. These are the people who work on people who are healthy and sick. It's like, is that the worst time? See, this is, you know, just in general philosophical perspective is it actually the wrong thing to appeal to authority well in this case what you're asking the doctors who deal with diseased people what they understand as disease that actually that appeal to authority is not the craziest thing in the world that might actually make sense to you that you you go to the hospital you go to the doctor you go to the like people who deal with this stuff they know or they at least have a sense of what disease is so as in, like, this is one of the times when appeal to authority might not be actually a fallacy. It might not be that crazy. In this section, we consider how compelling this criterion is as a full or partial definition of disease and think about how far our wanted pregnancy might fulfill this requirement. Although pregnancy is not formally cl classified as disease per se in modern medical practice, in many ways it is treated as such. Yeah, so now they're going to have to do a little dance because, you know, there ain't no doctor saying that uh, pregnancy is a disease. But they treat it as such, but they, they ain't saying that. Preventative medicine employs a variety of methods to stop pregnancy from occurring, including the provision of condoms, prescription of hormonal birth control pills, insertion of in intrauterine devices, injection of hormonal contraception, and surgical removal or restriction of the reproductive organs. In cases where pregnancy has already occurred, abortion may be regarded as a form of medical treatment that aims to cure the condition by preventing it from progressing to the more aggressive second stage. In this sense, the avoidance of pregnancy is a fairly routine and unexceptional aspect of medical practice in jurisdictions where contraception and abortion are available. In cases where pregnancy is wanted or where contraception and abortion are not available, pregnancy is still the focus of considerable medical attention and intervention. Pregnant women are expected to attend clinics or hospitals as a matter of course in order to facilitate medical surveillance. The pregnant woman's lifestyle choices are carefully tracked. Her weight, diet, exercise habits, alcohol, drug, and tobacco consumption become a matter of intense medical scrutiny. It is commonly regarded as a matter of urgency to ensure that a birthing woman has access to medical care. Interventions of various degrees of invasiveness may be employed, forceps and other me mechanical aids, drugs, surgical removal of the baby. Uh, yeah. Pregnant women who refuse medical interventions deemed necessary for their baby's health are commonly regarded as immoral or irrational. Even in jurisdictions where adults' rights to refuse medical treatment is legally protected, a pregnant woman is likely to experience invasive interventions in circumstances where robust consent protocols are either not possible or not regarded as being necessary. Conversely, where women request interventions for their own health or welfare in the birthing context, they may be regarded as whiny or selfish, and such interventions may be delivered late, brusquely, or withheld. After the birth, most women will need time to recover from the immediate effects of the delivery. Many will experience ongoing, perhaps lifelong complications requiring further medical interventions, surg surgical repair of prolapse, for example, or treatment for incontinence. Thus, if we define a disease simply as something that, med that medicine regards as an appropriate target for attention and or intervention, it seems that pregnancy is indeed treated as a disease, even though it is not explicitly classified as such. 
However, there is a strange selectivity about medicine's treatment of pregnancy. Pain and debilitating symptoms experienced by the woman are not always regarded as a basis for medical intervention in ways that they would be in other contexts. In contrast, if the fetus is at risk and some aspects of medical treatment are seen to suggest that being in a uterus is itself a situation of inherent risk, health professionals find it much easier to move into disease mode whereby the fetus location in the woman's body becomes pathological. In short, pregnancy is in some respects treated like a disease that threatens the fetus health and to a lesser extent like a disease that threatens the woman's health. A further complication here is that in some respects, the non-pregnant body is regarded as being diseased. In the context of fertility treatment, an otherwise healthy body is subjected to a range of painful and invasive medical interventions in order to bring about a condition that causes all the risks and symptoms described in our first section above. Another potentially counterintuitive example is that of elective vasectomy. Effectively, this treats male fertility as a disease. The treatment of pregnancy in medical practice is thus contradictory. To bring about a pregnancy is an explicit goal of medicine in some cases. Pregnancy once established are both overtreated and undertreated. I mean, again, uh, what's it called? A lot of treatments do very nasty things to the human body. And so you do a lot of stuff that you would regard as bad in order to get healthy again. So like, you know, taking medicine is generally not good for you because otherwise you would do it every day. You would take it like it was a vitamin. So it's like this makes some sense in terms of like, well, you do a lot of nasty things to yourself that is considered bad when you are in a certain condition. So I was like, this does make some sense that even though no one thinks of pregnancy as a disease, we are treating it as such. We do a lot of stuff like this. Anyway, pregnant women, I was just thinking of like uh, leeches being put on a body. <laughs> It's like, we don't normally regard leeches as healthy, but then under certain conditions, we use leeches medically. So I was like, speaking of like, you know, fetus, you know, taking stuff away from the uh, mother. Pregnant women are expected to bear a degree of pain and suffering that would merit treatment in other medical contexts without complaint or remedy. The gestating fetus, however, is regarded as being exquisitely vulnerable and in need of extensive medical surveillance control and intervention. To reformulate this in Cooper's terms, medics expend time, energy, and resources on attempting to bring about pee. They also spend time and effort trying to prevent pee. When pee is established, they go... They then go on to treat pee as a worrying state of affairs requiring medical intervention. Pee is both a disease and not a disease. Yeah. And so now we're getting into like what normally is happening. We don't actually have a good answer to this. So it's both a disease and not a disease looking at the medical interventions that we take. The medical practice approach thus seems unsatisfactory. On an anthropological level, it may be illuminating. But these questions we are asking is but the question we are asking is partly normative. Should P be regarded as a disease? Like moral relativism, moral medical relativism not only fails to help with normative questions, it makes it difficult to articulate such questions. What we are willing to consider disease is influenced by, by historically and culturally relative values. Conditions such as uh, drapetomania and hysteria were once classified as diseases. I have no idea what drepitomania is. Homosexuality was treated as a disease up until fairly recently in Orthodox Western Medicine. Thank you, Vipers, 1974. Now we know better. There simply is no condition such as hysteria in which the womb leaves its usual place and rampages around the body, causing havoc. Oh, that's what hysteria was? The womb was just going around, like, fucking with stuff? <coughs> Slave wanting to run away? Yeah. Yeah, like that was illegal and bad. Why would you ever want to run away? Yep. So I guess that they they treated that medically, Luke. <coughs> yeah, you're you're insane for t wanting to not be a slave. <coughs> Okay, other conditions are not so clearly based on mistaken facts, but seem to derive their disease status from a combination of facts and social values. Uh, Frank says the cure for hysteria in the late 40s was lobotomy. Yeah, like medicine is, uh, the history of medicine is really not so happy. A lot of it's very, very damaging. Okay. 
Yeah, drapetomania, for example, was a condition that affected slaves. And oh, that's what it was. Okay, yeah, yeah. so you're saying slaves running away? I didn't realize that's what you were referring to. So drapetomania was for slaves uh, in the slave-owning parts of the USA. Uh, DCI says Rachel Maines hypothesized that physicians from the classical era until the early 20th century commonly treated the hysteria by manually stimulating the genitals of female patients to the point of orgasm. Yeah, I just saw an article today on like Reddit or something. It says like you know. Like, uh, masturbation, like, makes uh, women's, like, mental health better. It's, like, shocking, you know? Like, oh, my God, orgasm. And they're, like, and people have always brought this up. Like, why do women orgasm? It's, like, you're fucking nutcases because it's good for your, like, it settles your brain. It settles for everybody, too. It's called post-nut clarity. Everyone's, like, get the dopamine. You get your just good brain drugs. Like, I always find that, like, the weirdest argument. But, like, that it has been an argument. Why do women orgasm? Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? But anyway. Its main symptom was a compulsion to run away, which was unamenable to any threats of punishment. In the context of a slave-owning society, this phenomenon was regarded as a bona fide disease. Likewise, homosexuality is not a mere figment of the imagination. It is plausible that heterosexual people are biologically different in some way from gay people. But society's categorization of this difference as a disease reflected a moral conviction that it w that it is wrong to be gay. Yeah. There was also a meme online where uh, when they, when it was like a, a medical thing in one of the Scandinavian company uh, countries, people would start calling in saying they were feeling a little gay and they had to stay home from work. Like, yeah. If we are to have, a cons have the conceptual tools to argue for or against the categorization of any condition as a disease, and these examples surely show that we do, not, we do need such tools, then the purely descriptive approach is unsatisfactory. Yeah. So, again, who are you ceding power to when you do an appeal to authority? Unfortunately, medical science is highly subject, subject to, like, political intervention and social norms of the day. So, again, like, if everyone who's in power is homophobic, and they can classify homophobia as uh, being gay as a disease. Uh, not homophobia as a disease. Uh, homosexuality as a disease. But, yeah. So it's like, that's not, maybe not the best way to go. But like I was saying before, if you like in the art world, this is one of the major theories, like what counts as art? Well, the people who are in charge of museums and stuff, like that is one way that uh, we classify art is like, well, the experts in art know what art is. Okay. Ah, now we're getting to the dysfunction theory. This is what I was talking about at the beginning, where, you know, the ancient theory of like, well, you want to have a good life, whatever is preventing you from having a good life is a kind of dysfunction, and disease is one of these things. So we can get back to the ancient uh, classical theories here. Okay, we have shown that pregnancy is harmful like measles. Like measles, pregnancy is also caused by an externally orig originating organism that enters the body and causes the harmful results we have described. Accordingly, this view, on this view, sperm could be seen as a pathogen in the same way that the measles virus is. Measles and pregnancy can also be medically treated, prevented, cured, or managed. Measles is more likely to be viewed as a misfortune, while a wanted pregnancy may be a cause for rejoicing, but as we have suggested, this is not a sufficient basis on which to make a robust distinction between the two, t the two in terms of their disease status. However, there is an important common sense difference between pregnancy and measles. Measles is a problem, an indication that something has gone wrong. Proponents of dysfunction account of disease, such as Wakefield, suggest that dysfunction is a necessary aspect of what we view as a disease. Dysfunction is something that deviates from the way an organism is supposed to be. See, I mean, see this? Aristotelian theory. The way an organism is supposed to be. There's a teleological theory. Uh, Luke says, my boyfriend and I keep trying to get pregnant. No, no luck yet. Well, I don't know if you uh, have the biology to do that, but I wish you best luck. What was it? There was one of these guys. Uh, he's a public speaker. He was a gay guy. And he was on some uh, show with uh, one of these conservative people. And she was like, you know, like you can't have a baby with your boyfriend because he was talking to a, a man, a biological man, with a, uh, well, who was dating another biological man. He says, you can't, or maybe it was his husband at the time, you can't have a baby with your husband. He says, well, with God's love and help, anything is possible. So anything is possible. Yeah, exactly. So you keep trying and maybe it'll work. I mean, with God's love, anything is possible. 
In turn, this causes suffering or harm. Suffering or harm alone in the absence of such dysfunction does not count as a disease. Yeah, like we suffer for many reasons. And like it doesn't mean that's a disease. It may mean like you go to the gym, you have to lift heavy weights and your arms are burning lifting heavy weights. Well, you did that to get in shape. That's not a disease. That was a choice you made to get in shape. Uh, Greg, <laughs> Greg and Ananti? Or maybe, I don't know. Measles is dysfunctional. In contrast, it is commonly regarded as a mark of a healthy body that can become pregnant. It is this, perhaps, that justifies the use of medical intervention to bring about pregnancy, despite the fact that it will put the sufferer's health at risk. Uh, I can do any. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4:13. Exactly. So the the conservatives who are against uh, gay marriage are just not. Uh, you know, well versed in uh, Philippians 4.13, you know, <clears throat> they should study their Bible more. Okay, remedying dysfunction is the appropriate business of medicine, and that which is not a dysfunction cannot be a disease. It is clear that the concept of dysfunction plays an important role in common sense understanding of disease, but this also gives rise to a number of very complex and perhaps insurmountable problems. This, after all, is why philosophers such as Cooper and others look for an account of disease that does not rely on ideas of how an organism ought to function. Uh, Frank says Jesus did a lot more curing diseases than causing them. Yeah, 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 it's true. Did Jesus get anyone pregnant? though so we we don't have that as an example and if you say yes or you say no that's going to be very contentious uh so i mean maybe he did get someone pregnant and so maybe he did cause disease jesus got himself pregnant ah there now we're getting somewhere have i tried folic acid b9 yeah exactly dysfunction is defined in in relation to its opposite. When something is dysfunctional, it's performing wrongly, it is not behaving in accordance with the intention of the designer. But this seems to presuppose that there is a right way to perform or a design, and that this design is perceptible to us. In other words, this is a way of understanding disease that seeks to base its classifications and objective facts about how an organism should behave. You see, this is the issue. Normative things over here. How should an organism behave? But the concept of a healthy functioning it of healthy functioning itself demands a normative evaluation. Yep, and see, this is what I was saying right at the beginning. This is like the little bit I know about this, is that this is where the the classical philosophy comes in. What is flourishing? What is healthy functioning? Yeah, yeah. You've seen the Da Vinci Code, exactly. Is this Aristotelian? This is the old Aristotelian theory, and it never went away. People are still using um, neo-Aristotelian thought in this area. And so, like... This is why people are classicists, because Aristotle was fucking good, and people suck at metaphysics, and Aristotle was good at metaphysics, and that's why his stuff doesn't go away. It comes back in new versions, because this sort of dysfunction theory is still useful. People still um, uh, use it. So, I don't think this paper is going to be Aristotelian, but this is talking about neo-Aristotelian medical ethics here. And of course, if I think I shouted out Aristotle earlier, but everyone, yeah... Aristotle, Aristotle, I can't say it. Aristotalitarian. There we go. Aristotalitarian. Yeah, it's a little bit of a tongue twister because I just want to say Aristotle, but Aristotalitarian. Yeah, takes me a sec. Okay, so yeah, this is normative, Aristoic. It goes beyond being merely descriptive. In contrast with Cooper's subjective approach, the evaluative element is baked in at a far removed level from the lived experience of the sufferer. Instead, experts make these judgments and patients and practitioners accept them and act accordingly. It is fundamentally elitist. Yeah. So who decides what's the right thing? Aristic Aristication. Yeah. But like el elitist. Uh, so what would that? Uh, the aristocrats? Yeah, aristocrats. Aristocratic. Aristocratic. That's the whole fucking word. It's, it is aristocratic. It's, it's aristocratic. The, the, uh, it's elitist. 
The dysfunction of probes is also problematic in a more basic way, that it derives an ought from an is. The expert observes the phenomena in question, theorizes and makes his pronouncement as to how the organism should behave. This leap from the descriptive to the normative is enormously problematic, and this problem seems insurmountable for anyone who would try to base an understanding of disease on concepts of dysfunction. Team Elite, yeah, yeah. The question of what constitutes good functioning is not obviously one that we can divine simply from, uh, uh, simply from observing the behavior of an organism or studying biology or chemistry or from theorizing about these phenomena. I mean, yeah, if you're going to go like the hard biological view that all we do is like have kids, but I mean, clearly society and that's not actually how all of society works. So it's like saying in any given spot, you can't rely on this theory because then you're just making yourself the authority on how the world is. That's not the case. The notion of proper functioning bars from a teleological view, that's a teleological view of our organisms, or alternative from the belief that there is indeed a designer. Aristotelian classical theory. Can we really expect to recognize, recognize how an organism should be? Does it even make sense to suppose that there is a right way for an organism uh, for an organism, how an organism should function. Typically, most educated people believe that humans evolved along with other species as a product of a long series of random genetic reshufflings. We are not the product of a loving, careful, intelligent designer. That our bodies work in a particular way is not an indication of how they should be, but is simply an indication that at some point in our past, these traits were not incompatible with our going, uh, with our ongoing survival in the environments we inhabited. Yeah. I would have said this last bit differently, and that's why I added it earlier. Just because our species needs kids to survive doesn't mean any one person needs that. And so it's like, well, so in that case, you don't need to say maybe some pregnancy is required for the species, but it may be required as a dysfunction in other parts. So it's like, again, this is basically true what they said, but I would have argued that differently. But that's just me. Normal species function. As we've shown in terms of health risks, symptoms, and medical treatments, pregnancy shares many features with conditions that we regard as being diseases. Yet pregnancy is not usually considered a disease despite these similarities. This is partly because pregnancy is not regarded as dysfunctional. However, as we suggest, it is a mistake to rely on concepts of dysfunction as a mode of classifying phenomena. Our suggestion here is that we set aside the notion of dysfunction and turn to the question of normal function. Okay, so now we're trying to sophisticate this. Normal functioning is a descriptive concept that allows for a purely fact-based understanding of disease. So does this make a difference for the way we should understand pregnancy? The concept of normal species function... Yeah, we are malfunctioning monkeys, Ivan. And the concept of normal species function has been used by some writers in order to distinguish what we should or should not classify as a disease. We tend to think of pregnancy as a normal aspect of human life in a way that measles, for example, is not. But what does normal species function really mean here? Most humans are not capable of becoming pregnant. Moreover, in many species, including humans, it is not normal for every individual to reproduce. Male pheasants, which do not establish territory, tend not to mate. Groups of primates often contain only one sexually active male. Pregnancy is not normal for men, nor girls under 11, or women over 51. But what if we narrow down to consider only those of reproductive age, that is 15 to 49? Is pregnancy normal for this group? Currently, there are approximately 1.8 billion such women in existence, but there are only around 211 million pregnancies yearly. Thus, the norm for people in this group is not to be pregnant. Based purely on numbers, pregnancy is abnormal, even within the narrowest target group we can define. So we can really, so can we really insist that pregnancy constitutes normal species function when most of the people in the target group are not pregnant? I mean, this, I think it's because they're going to biostatistical theory next. I mean, look, most people aren't going to be pregnant, but most people don't also don't need like, I mean, 15 to 49 is a range of like 30, no, 25 years. Most people don't have 25 kids. You only need a few kids over those years. So it's like, do you need three kids in the, in those 25 years to, or like two kids to make up for you and your husband or whatever it is? Um, like to keep the number even. Um, so I'm not entirely sure. Was this paper written by Eternalized Dragon Dude? Yes, of course it was. Uh, <laughs> Every time the gene separates from the monkeys, it's genetic disease. Yeah, Frank. Uh, laugh while I can. D says, Aristotle, it's time for you to get your pregnancy vaccine unzips. There we go. 
So yeah, I, I mean, I don't love this little bit of argument here. Like they're saying normal, but to at least maintain current levels, people only have to be pregnant twice, uh, like two times in between being 15 and 49 to maintain the species, the species count. Um, so I think it's a little bit weird, but yes, most of the time, uh, you, most people are not pregnant. You haven't heard anything wrong in this paper? Um, no, this is a mostly negative paper, um, Frank. So this happens when people are taking a negative point of view. They uh, raise an issue and then they attack all the positions. And so they actually haven't given a positive view yet. So there's nothing to attack. This is something like uh, happens in analytic philosophy sometimes where basically they don't, their, their point is basically that we don't have a good understanding of a topic yet that we thought we did and these are quite often the strongest argument argued papers because they're just tearing everyone else down and so it's like okay we this means we need more work in this area but i mean what is their positive thesis at this point uh, see, Frank says, uh, pregnancy is plainly its own unique reference class. That isn't a disease, but for, if it wasn't exactly what it is, we would call it a disease. Yeah, but Frank, that doesn't solve the problem. Saying it's unique is just saying, okay, we don't know at that point. Like we don't have, a, we don't have a general thing. So it's like, yes, you were correct, but that's not going to help. Cause that's like just giving something a name, but naming something doesn't explain it. It's just, uh, giving it a term saying it's unique. Well, Okay. But what's special about it that's making it unique? DCI says, me either. I vibe with it. I will never repeat this to a pregnant lady or anyone else. Again, yeah, this isn't a paper where you're like arguing that you have a disease. I actually saw this joke in um, House MD. Somebody goes in, didn't understand their symptoms. He's like, oh, you've got a parasite. And she goes, oh, what's going to happen? He says, well, in about nine months, about like seven months, it'll you'll take care of it and you'll have a kid. And it was like, ah, ha, ha, you're a jerk house. But like, uh, it's like, yes. Um, but yeah, this is a purely negative paper up to this point. They haven't made a single positive statement about what disease, uh, pregnancy should be considered as. And so, yeah. Um, and I've heard this position on pregnancy before that it is very unique to me. I don't like calling it very unique or whatever. I mean, I just take the negative that we have that we are shitty at understanding pregnancy at the moment. So, yeah. I salute you. Thank you for the follow. <laughs> Pattern juggler. Huh. I don't know if that was... Well, I don't. Even, I didn't get the register. That's interesting, too. It's not on my activity feed. Interesting. Okay. Bohr's biostatistical theory. Among the theorists who claim that health and disease can be defined in ways that are free of extraneous assumptions or values, Christopher Bohr's biostatistical theory, theory BST, is perhaps the most prominent. Bors eschews the idea that normatively laden understandings or values are necessary for the identification of, di of disease. Yeah, so this is what it happens is the, the uh, I can't speak laden uh, understandings. There's a few of these terms out there where they basically say we have multiple understandings of one word and we don't have anything pinned down. So it's just a theory of polysemy for you uh, linguists out there, where it's just things have so many meanings attached to them that there is no way to pin it down. Ivan says, I think there's a futile exercise. Yes, naming something is sort of irrelevant. Controversial questions surrounding pregnancy are about values and misunderstandings of materialism, and everything they're saying is supervenient on values. It's not informative. Um, well, it would be at least instrumentally informative. If you see from someone from your pers uh, perspective, yeah, it seems like that's what the case. I agree with what you say. From someone who does not already have that perspective, then they might have been favoring one of these other views, and this would be helpful. So, even even in your uh, position there, this would be moving everyone else in your direction, Ivan. So it's like you might see it as instrumentally helpful or pragmatic, even if it's not uh, particularly helpful in your position. It would move everyone closer to your position. I think it's saying that pregnancy should often be called a disease. Maybe, Frank. I want to get wait to the end to see what they actually say. Because I don't think... Um, I mean, they might make that conclusion. They might also just, you know, wishy-washy. I'm not sure. Um, they, they Okay, so you think their strategy is they're going to get there eventually? Plausible. I don't know where they're going. I don't know where they're going. Uh, yeah. 
DCS says, how would you build on this negative paper to state that we don't understand pregnancy very well and leaves it to be defined as a disease? Good question, DCI. I have not thought about the metaphysics of pregnancy. I've read a few papers on that on stream. I've seen a talk on that many years ago by Suki Finn, who, uh, who works in this area. Um, I don't know. The, the honest answer is I'd have to look, read all the stuff and see if I could come up with a better theory than exists here. Like I do metaphysics. I like this is the, this, like I should say, this is something I might consider working on if I had like, like a lot of time in the future or something like the idea that we don't have a good metaphysical description of pregnancy might be an interesting topic for me to go into because, uh, you know, like if this is the case, as they show here, that we all of our current descriptions are not so helpful, then maybe I would sit there and be like, well, what can I do that's different from other people? I don't know. Um, but like, seriously, this is a hard problem. This is a difficult problem. That's why papers like this get written um, to show that either it is a disease, which would be weird, or we don't understand the concept as it stands. And so it's like this would be something I'd have to put some like serious effort into because I can't come up with an answer this quickly. This is a serious problem. But again, you'd have to, as Ivan was pointing out, the value we associated with having kids, it, like this would be wrapped up with so many other things in our society and like our ideas and philosophy that if you're just a materialist, yeah, you can take the materialist, lo materialist line. I don't think that's going to fly in the end. It's just too wrapped up with a lot of aspects of how we think of ourselves, identity, society, and stuff. And so even if you have like a materialist baseline, you'd need to say more. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Vipers. I appreciate that. You know, you're doing one for the society. Frank says, is a disease even when one when tech is available to have a baby in other ways. Yeah, there's like a, was it ectogenesis and stuff? There's like cool terms for this. So like, could you just go put like a baby in like a, like an external, uh, like womb, like external wombs. And so that, I remember that was one of the things that Suki Finn, one of the papers I wrote, uh, read about, uh, this before was on. So like what happens at that point? And it still doesn't make sense. It still doesn't make sense. I think that was like, I remember it was like 72 something somewhere in there. Uh, Luke says, I think we're in alignment. See potential problem here with the taxonomy's definitions. Most people, um, most theories are designed to rule out pregnancy. You still see a problem. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So what matters is, so, okay. This theory goes, what matters is pure statistics. Oopsie, wrong highlighter. This one. What matters is pure statistics. Thus, on Borses approach, <coughs> phenomena that are statistically, typically within certain categories, for example, sex, age, sex and age are healthy for individuals concerned. Okay. Yeah. So being pregnant for women in like their twenties is a typical thing women in their twenties do. And so this is kind of what I was saying. Yeah. So like if it's on average, something that 20 to 25 year old women do at a certain rate, then that would be normal. Yeah. Kyle. Hey, Kali, what's up? How are you doing? Well, I've never heard anything more horrible in my life than what matters is pure statistics. Yeah, see, uh, Kali is a buddy. She is a linguistics streamer. How you doing, Kali? She was streaming earlier today. Everyone go give Kali a follow. But, like, welcome to philosophy where we get to say terrible things. Um, yeah. So, yeah, if you don't know Kali, go give Kali a follow. She uh, usually streams uh, Sunday uh, morning to afternoon, at least my time, East, Co East Coast U.S. time. Um, and, uh, you get to talk about a little bit of language in related topics. So a lot of fun stuff. If you're interested in like philosophy of language, there's people there, um, also. So yeah, classic philosophy move. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. What is the most terrible thing that could possibly be the case? And then we follow up on that. So, but I mean, they brought up the question and you can, you can, the next line was going to be completely obvious. So like they say something horrible and then they say, as we have shown, being pregnant is not normal. Like they say it is not normal for any reference class. However, narrowly we define it. You're way on your bed when you couldn't help yourself from saying something. Yes, I get the lurkers out of lurk. It's a skill. Not so easy to do. Like, yeah, getting lurkers out of lurk is hard. And as I always say, I don't know if you're here. I never check my, uh, chat list using chat and I don't call people out so feel free to lurk if you want to lurk I'm not calling you out just 
enjoy if you want. So yeah, but thanks for stopping by. Um, yeah. <laughs> so. <clears throat> okay, so. But for Boris, considerations of survival, reproduction, organism, part, process, species, sex, age, and causation are also taken into account. Yeah, so. Boris is trying to, it's, it's called the Texas sharpshooter strategy, where you're trying to make something look the right way it is by narrow, by circumscribing around exactly what you want to talk about. So the fact that a woman, get, a woman gets pregnant makes it healthy because they want it to be healthy and they define as many statistics as they can to narrow in on that. This is the, uh, you fre frequently check your list? I know, other people do. I know it's a thing. I don't. I... Because, I mean, one of the reasons I don't is the reason I'm on Twitch sometimes, and I know a lot of other people are, is you want to chill out. You don't want to deal with people. And so the fact, the idea that, like, you know, I want to just be anonymous sometimes. And so, like, I want that experience for other people. They don't want to, if they don't want to talk, that's fine with me. Like, they just want to observe. Cool. Like, no problem. I know people have started chatting, in, like, in and like here and like I'm like treat them like welcome them in but they knew stuff that happened half an hour ago I'm like oh well I didn't know you were here they were here but I they didn't say anything that's fine but yeah <clears throat> so yeah this is Texas sharpshooter it's called the name of the fallacy but uh, it's just funny you don't normally get to bring that one up but uh yeah this is the plate platonic uh man is a featherless biped and then when Diogenes uh calls him out on it he says with a, a wide flat fig uh nails broad a uh, broad uh, broad flat uh nails yeah and so you just keep adding another property until you can narrow down what you want but it's bullshit okay so yeah so you take all the things you want into account on this basis it looks as pregnancy can indeed be considered normal even though most people are not pregnant Interestingly, this aspect of Boris's approach means that homosexuality is classified as a disease. Ha ha ha. Yeah, isn't that funny? Yeah, because the people who never have sex in the typical amount would be massively out of the, um, in the hetero, not typical, heterosexual sex, then they would be very far from the average. Yeah. Even if more people were homosexual than heterosexual, homosexuality, it is assumed, is not compatible with reproduction. Yeah. Well, again... Uh, with God's love. If we accept Boris's view, we cannot argue that pregnancy itself is a disease. Indeed, perhaps nothing could be classified as a disease, provided that it contributes to survival and or reproduction. Here, here some other challenges emerge. We have already noted that homosexuality is straightforwardly a disease on Boris's account. Seemingly, menopause could also qualify as a disease, despite the fact that it is a near-universal phenomenon for women who live beyond 50. Menopause impedes an inf individual's fertility for decades of their lifespan. Of course, Boris might argue, as have various evolutionary theorists, that the menopause frees women from direct reproductive labor in order to make them available for grandmothering duties. In fact, similar arguments have been made to support the reproductive and survival value of homosexuality. Viper says, if pregnancy was a disease, would should it uh, have legal implications for men? Um, yeah, so you were causing disease. So, like, I mean, it would be a sexually transmitted disease, and if you were, and there are other people who, like, knowingly spread AIDS to, like, HIV to people, and they have been prosecuted, so it would be, uh, I would assume it would be, like, the people who knowingly spread HIV. Um, so I would assume so. <clears throat> However, a problem with this kind of explanation and justification is that the essence, the statistical part of BST, seems to lose its significance. Instead, we have an appeal to statistical normality within a set of very normatively laden parameters. Moreover, in a social species such as humans, social factors influence reproductive behavior, not mere biological fertility. We are a technological species. We harness tools to further our ide ideological goals. Thus, why uh, wh thus, while homosexual people and postmenopausal women cannot conceive naturally, they can and do produce offspring in today's society with technological help. Boris's approach means that disease status is not intrinsic to any specific phenomenon. Yeah, so again, it's uh, cherry-picking the statistics you want to fit your preconceived notion of what counts as healthy, which uh, pregnancy is for this. That's what it is. It's a Texas sharpshooter, which is, which is a very specific... Uh, cherry-picking of statistics. 
I just like saying it because you know uh, an, a less common uh, f- uh, fallacy. Okay, but a Boris approach means that disease is not intrinsic to any specific phenomena, but arises from its circumstantial relationship with the individual it pertains to and the environment in which that animal finds itself. So yeah, see, they're not saying it exactly like I am. They're saying arises from its circumstantial relationship. What the fuck is a circumstantial relationship? It's a cherry-picked relationship. Very specific one. Humans are animals that have extraordinary abilities to manipulate and adapt their environment. Therefore, what encourages or hinders reproduction is subject to change. Yeah, And so they're picking out the ones that they want, even though it's subject to change. Yeah. So... Setting this aside for now, it seems that there are ways in which the BST may still fail to fully protect pregnancy from disease status. For example, if pregnancy is no longer necessary for reproduction, its health disease status comes back into question. This might seem a fanciful point to raise. However, developments in biomedical research have led to experts in research in recent years to question whether pregnancy is inevitable and inexorably a necessary part of human reproduction. Human trials in extracorporeal uteruses or artificial wombs are currently being planned as a follow-up to the successful gestation of lambs in bio bags. Yep, is what the uh, other stuff I've read on uh, Philosophy Roulette was about, this sort of thing. An additional challenge arising from Boris's approach is that contraception, education, and gender equality are very clearly correlated with fewer pregnancies. Perhaps rather than construing pregnancy as a disease, we should regard women's liberation as pathological and the use of contraception, despite its popularity, as fundamentally diseased. And this, I think, uh, was the point Vipers was raising earlier, that this would be seen this way. Boris's analysis also leaves us in a difficult position as regards abortion. In this context, survival and reproduction are profoundly at odds. A woman who is in the first trimester of pregnancy is statistically more likely to survive if she has an abortion than if she continues with pregnancy. So is is it abortion or pregnancy that is pathological here, or both, or neither? This is, I think, a good example, because this shows that they're picking and choosing the statistics they want. It makes it ad hoc. Yeah, more human than human, yep. So this show, this is a good example. So even though I like, I mean, I particularly like my, you know, picking out what the um, fallacy that was going on here. I think the, the authors here deserve a lot of credit for making this clear because it's not an obvious fallacy. Okay. A final problem with Bors's BST and the normal species function account is that they cannot easily account for factors that may connect reproduction and survival in negative ways, whether at the individual or the species level. As we have shown, reproduction is risky for human females at the individual level. Perhaps this is one reason for the plummeting birth rates in countries where women are able to choose whether and when to reproduce. Risks to individuals cannot be entirely separated from those to the species itself. Species evolve and become extinct for many reasons. Yeah, okay, this is another good one because I was saying how it was very individualistic so from earlier so they're they're hitting the points i got to earlier species evolve and become extinct for many reasons in some contexts a species reproductive habits may not be conductive conducive to long-term survival and ultimately the species dies out in this case reproduction is not obviously healthy since it leads to species towards extinction yeah think overpopulation if you're just counting babies overpopulation will kill the uh, species very quickly because you will eat all the food and everyone will starve to death so it can't just be baby counts in this example, for example, sexual selection that leads to unwieldy, unwieldy antlers in deer or tail feathers that are incompatible with flight in birds. Yeah. Could something like this also happen to humans? We are a species that has been around for an extraordinarily short period of time in evolutionary terms. Human childbirth is significantly more painful, protracted, and lethal than delivery in other mammal species. As noted, gender equality leads to plummeting birth rates, perhaps precisely because human birth is so traumatic for the human body and is incompatible with many other goods that humans value. We cannot infer from our existence now that we are equipped to survive indefinitely, nor that reproduction will continue as we know it okay so we're finally getting to straight up infertility as a disease oh no actually i'm sorry not fertility as a disease is infertility as a disease so the in is important here so infertility as a problem okay Recently, considerable attention has been given to the question of whether infertility is a disease. Many of the same considerations have been raised as those 
we discuss here. Kukla's analysis is highly relevant. Yeah, so this is Quill Kukla that was brought up earlier in chat. Analysis is highly relevant for our exploration here, although we argue, as it were, from different ends of the fertility spectrum. Kukla notes that to classify something as a disease brings it into a certain domain. It can be researched, treated. Those who have it are sufferers or patients and have an implicit claim on our health resources, our concern, and perhaps even our compassion. Equally, our Equally, of course, as we note above, there are risks in de- designating something as a disease. It may serve to entrench social disadvantage and feed into harmful stereotypes. At the most extreme, the rhetoric of health and disease can be a feature of genocidal ideologies, such as those embraced by the Nazis. Kukla suggests that to designate something as a disease cannot be done on a purely factual or neutral basis, as Bors attempts to do. In determining whether X is a disease or not a disease, we need to engage with the question of what level of risk is acceptable. In other words, how bad would it be if we misclassified it? Interestingly, there seems... There seem to be considerable benefits associated with classifying with the classification of infertility as a disease. Yeah, I'm starting to lose my mind here. I yeah, I've been streaming almost three hours, although the uh cause I lost about a half hour to an internet crash. <clears throat> but yeah, that's when my brain starts really going. We'll see. Okay. Uh, Interestingly, there seems to be considerable benefits associated with classification of infertility as a disease. Most significantly, of course, it would suggest, as Kukla says, that infertility merits treatment. Those who suffer from infertility thus have a strong reason to prefer that infertility is treated as a disease. Yet to designate a phenomenon as a disease, we need to be clear about what it is that we are referring to. In her analysis, Kukla notes that there is no standard universally accepted definition of infertility. Those definitions that do exist are full of contradictions and tensions as an epistemic mess. According to Kukla, the focus in classifying infertility as a disease is not based on medical or scientific precision or epistemic serviceability, but ways of reinforcing certain values and pathologizing certain narratives that go against these values. All diseases, on Kukla's view, are associated with value to a certain degree. But what marks out infertility in particular is that other diseases, which are also attached to social values, can be reliably associated with independent features. Breast cancer, for example, is not about a product of how one feels, but also comes with an identifiable set of objective physical characteristics that can be measured and verified empirically. In contrast, the disease of infertility exists only in relation to a particular wish, the wish to have a child. Without this, a person or couple may never even realize that they are infertile. We agree with Kukla that the classification of infertility as a disease is epistemic, epistemically problematic. Infertility is treated as a disease not because of its objective physiological or scientific features, but because of social norms that incline us to think people should have children. Luke says maybe this gets us Ivan's early point about something being unwanted associated and associated values. Yeah, so I have to give the authors credit here. Involve yourself. How you doing, Agni? How what's going on? Uh, buddy, uh, Valve Yourself TV is a philosophy streamer too, sometimes. Mostly does uh, guided meditations on his channel. Let's give him a shout out. How you been, at, uh, Evolve Yourself? And uh, he's also a chess tutor IRL, and so you can get some uh, chess instruction if that's what you're interested in. But yeah, he's a good dude. Go check him out. Uh, and so, But he's uh, also on the analytic ph- uh, philosophy side with me. And, you know, doing some mind, philosophy of science sort of things. It's good stuff. Hey, Shane. Doesn't mean it's not a disease. Nothing means it's not a disease, of course. And also, Shane, how you doing? And Shane, now you're going to have to force me to do... I don't even know if I have my old shout-out. Shout-out. Shane. Let's see if this works. It doesn't. I don't have it even anymore. I'll give Shane a shout-out later. Shane is a sociologist and uh, historian. He does a lot of history over on his channel. Just got back from a trip. A lot of cool pictures from uh, Central America. And, uh, yeah, go hang out with uh, Shane. Just read your highest blitz chess rating. Congratulations. It's going to be up there. You're good at chess. Uh, so, yeah. So, yeah. We've got some friends in chat. Yeah, we're just reading this paper on uh, classifying pregnancy as a disease. I mean, they know it's provocative. And this is one of these papers where it's just doing the analytic thing of shooting down all the big theories. And it's going to end on either they're going to give some theory or just say we need to, like, you know, 
get our heads around pregnancy is something we don't quite understand yet. But, like, uh, don't know what's going to happen. So, but like, that's where we're at. And, you know, I think they're doing a pretty good job of it. Like, they're talking about most of the issues. Okay. Yeah, because we think people should have children. And so when people can't have children when they want to, when they should have them, then it's a problem. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Blitz 1782. That's very strong still. Yeah, slower time controls, you're stronger. Yeah, because I know you, uh, you've said before in your streaming, like, your end game. You can think through all the positions. So that's good. It's like, yeah. Here we push Kukla's reasoning further to suggest that there is a corresponding failure of the medical establishment, society, and philosophers to pathologize pregnancy itself. This is the flip side of the coin that Kukla presents. Ah, so yeah. So they said, look, it is a disease, and so, like, because infertility is the disease, not pregnancy. So, look, this is how we have to think about it. Luke says, your highest all-in-way was 17 for daily games? Yeah. I think people should breathe. <laughs> Yeah, well, these are philosophers. They're not really people, Shane. <laughs> this is the flip side of the coin that Kukla presents. Kukla gives four grounds on which we should be critical about the classification of infertility as a disease. These are, one, conflict and inconsistency between definitions. Two, lack of any unified physical syndrome. Three, the risks are social rather than medical. Four, the risks are only risks within a particular set of social values. We can apply these to pregnancy in reverse, so to speak, for Kukla to classify... Yeah, okay, so they're just going to redo Kukla. Okay, for Kukla to classify infertility as a disease is problematic because it fails on these four points. Accordingly, by implication, phenomena that perform well on these criteria are more convincingly to be understood as diseases. To take the first criterion, Kukla rightly notes that the variability in definitions of... Variability in definitions of infertility... In contrast, there is very little inconsistency in the definition of pregnancy. A common joke is that one cannot be a little bit pregnant. Moreover, pregnancy is objectively verifiable, is binary in the way that Kukla says cancer is. Uh, one is either pregnant or not. The question of whether one is pregnant does not depend on how, one, how the person feels about it, unlike infertility, into the definition of which the wish for a child is written. The risks of pregnancy are medical, to use Kukla's terminology, terminology rather than social, though of course they can also and often are both. The import of Kukla's argument is that the it is the social norm that people should have children that makes infer infertility a disease. Likewise, we should suggest that it is the social norm that people should have children that tends to preclude our ability to recognize pregnancy as a disease. The two go hand in hand. Okay, so if infertility is a disease, then so is pregnancy. Because if you're going to define pregnancy, um, infertility in this way, then so goes pregnancy. I have a problem with this. I think they're falling for the same thing that they did earlier. Just because Kukla gave a disease, uh, said infertility is a problem, that doesn't mean you should rely on Kukla as, you know, a platonic uh, descriptor giving you, like, the what actually counts. This just also means that Kukla has to do more work to define infertility as a disease. It does not also imply that pregnancy is a disease. Only if you regard Kukla as some sort of, like, uh, person who has, like, access to the platonic heaven does like Kukla get to define the criteria? Like we like uh, well, Quill Kukla now. We like Kukla as a philosopher. Doesn't make them right, you know? Intellectual bait and switch. Yes, Shane. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. But um, so I think they just missed a line here. They this should have been like this last line where they say the two go hand in hand. They should say if you consider infertility a disease on these criteria, then pregnancy is a disease. They should have put it in the hypothetical because then they could say if you don't, then it doesn't matter, but you can't even classify infertility uh as a disease in this way. Like this is not the strategy. Luke says, I think they may be saying that if one takes Kukla's argument as sound, then it must also accept the argument or something like, yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to get at, the hypothetical. That's what you're saying, the if-then. That's the hypothetical. That's what I wanted to say. So, yeah. So, I think they overstepped a little bit here because, well, we like Kukla as a philosopher. I'm with them on that. Um, so, but I think they gave Kukla a little bit too much credit there. Okay. 
medicalization. Many of those who have written about pregnancy and childbirth, especially from a feminist perspective, are concerned about the ways in which these phenomena can be over-medicalized. If the disease view of pregnancy results in a patriarchal inter interference, coercion, or intrusive surveillance, then we should be concerned. However, pregnancy is already routinely monitored and controlled. Women are already under heavy pressure from society and from medical experts to channel their gestational capacity in ways that are deemed suitable. Pathologizing pregnancy could, in fact, lead to a better treatment for women. Ah, ha, ha. We finally get it. They did this because treating it as a disease is actually better socially for women. Now we know why. Because they know all this stuff. These are not stupid people. These have they presented some pretty good arguments and have a pretty good overview. They have a pretty good grasp of this of the situation here. This was their little kicker. It's that actually treating pregnancy as a disease is better for women. <laughs> uh it's funny. Okay. So yeah, right here. Pathologizing pregnancy could in fact lead to a better treatment for women. If pregnancy is construed as a disease and access to con contraception and abortion as preventative medicine, it puts the provision of these interventions on a different footing. This is not about family planning or reproductive autonomy, but about medical need. See, it's, it's shifting the terminology into medical need, not the social need. Yep, Luke, well, it's social important. If it's a disease, we got to devote more, yeah, more ro uh, resources to it or different ones. Shane says, I don't buy that argument, though. Not all diseases result in better treatment. Many diseases come uh, with negative social stigmas. Well, their point is that those things, like, that's what they said right up here. They said, we already get that. We already get that stuff. So we're already getting that. And so the idea is that using a different model might not be worse off. Yeah. No, but like they, they know. That's what this uh, they were saying here. Um, so interference, coercion, intrusive surveillance, that all comes currently with it. So it's like this this line right here. Like these this one and then like this right here. So it's like this uh, right at the page break. They were saying that stuff. Okay. Among women who are pregnant, their preferences in terms of pain relief, mode of delivery are frequently ignored precisely because of the normalness of these conditions, mean that their detrimental effects on women are disregarded, and the norms of medical ethics that govern doctor-patient interactions are often swept aside. Con to construe pregnancy and childbirth as a disease may offer an opportunity to reconfigure the relationship between the pregnant woman and the medical establishment. Yeah. Okay, so they're trying to get away from the social norms here and get it into the full medical norms to get better treatment for women. We have argued that there are pragmatic grounds for classifying pregnancy as a disease on the basis that it shares important features with other diseases, such as measles. To be pregnant is to experience symptoms and face significant risks to life and health. We acknowledge that on that on accounts such as Boris's, pregnancy is not obviously a disease, but we note that such accounts seem to seem to open further prob problematic questions about the relationship between pregnancy, evolution, and species survival. We suggest that it is possible to find value in the experience of disease, and that therefore to classify pregnancy as a disease does not preclude the possibility of its being valuable to those who experience it. Likewise, although we acknowledge the risks of medicalization, we emphasize the point that pregnancy is already heavily medicalized, but in ways that simultaneously tend to deprive women of patient status, thus increasing their vulnerability in the medical system. As things currently stand, cesarean section is one of the most common medical interventions and one of the most common reasons for hospitalization in modern societies is childbirth. Yet maternity services are often underfunded. Women report terrible experiences while giving birth and at the same time heavy pressure to become pregnant. We conclude that, as Kukla has shown in the context of infertility, the classification of something as either disease or not disease has profound normative implications. While classifying pregnancy as a disease comes with some risks, we suggest that a failure to recognize and respond to disease-like features is problematic and puts many pregnant people at increased risk as well as serving to reinforce and entrench social pressures on women in particular. Ah. <sighs> Shane says there are more people now being diagnosed with things like depression and there are more options for depression, but that has not eliminated the social stigma of depression and people talking about depression now gets called out for being fake or attention seeking. Yes, but that doesn't mean that the more treatments are 
bad in general and then people calling it out for you know virtue signaling or some bullshit reason um takes anything away from the actual depressed people or depression just because people there's bad actors out there using depression for like using the term or using their their uh, diagnosis for their gain doesn't mean that like you should be basing policy on the bad actors yeah their policy th yes their argument here is a social one and my complaint here is that they're defaulting to the disease. It's clearly different from disease, but they're just saying, well, all the arguments for it being not a disease fail, so let's just call it a disease. But, like, it, there are reasons why we do need to have kids. So it's like, there is something out there that makes it different, but they're just defaulting to saying, well, we all the current rules don't work, and so let's default to it. I don't like defaulting arguments. I just find them like, well, just because those definitions failed, that's on the philosophers, that's a philosophical failure, not one, and not that we should just go down and be like, now it's a disease. Um... Luke says, I think the argument is analytical, maybe aimed for conclusion and social pragmatic reasons. Maybe. No, I think that's a description of it. It is an analytic argument. And speaking of, now we can review it. Um, so this is an analytic argument. What it does is it tries to knock out all the things that says pregnancy is not a disease. So we should classify it as a disease because that would have benefit to women. Now, how much benefit is arguable here as Shane has brought up and as they mentioned there are problems with calling something a disease it gets abused and so is that a good thing I don't know but they're saying maybe we should try this as opposed to the way we are have been going because the way we have been going is problematic anyone new here feel free um not natal yeah Feel free to use the emotes that you can see in chat below or in next to me here. If you thought this had some fun ideas, you give it a brain dance. And I'm so sorry, but you have to spell everything correctly. So big B, uh, small B, big D in brain dance. Nog grapes. If you if you thought it made big claims that shriveled up. Nog navel, navel gazing only for academics. Nog or ouroboros for deeper ancient ideas. Nog scream for existential or artistic drama. Nog turd, all style, no substance. So still poop underneath. So if you thought this was like, you know... I'm not, I wouldn't be too surprised if like someone was just like, well, this was all bullshit, you know? And the nog knife slicing and dicing arguments. So yeah, so if this didn't work for you, you know, you get some of like the nay, and then there's of course the vote nay if you don't like it, vote yay if you do, and vote meh if you thought it was very meh. So Shane said meh and navel gazing. Luke says navel gazing and uh, brain dance. Frank says yay, but nothing qualified for dancing. Luke also gave it... um a yay and a brain dance. Yeah. Aris gave it a meh brain dance. Um, I'm going to give this a nog knife actually. I thought, yeah. And Luke also gave it a knife. I'm going to give this a nog knife. This is a very analytic style argument. And I didn't think they did a bad job with it. They went through a bunch of, uh, analytic sort of style definitions. They knocked them all down. They fucked up the one at the end. And we pointed that out. Um, yeah, multiple of us did that. Uh, but yeah, so I'm going to give this a knife. Paper for well way too long. Yeah, well, that's also analytic philosophy too. Um, I thought this was okay. I'm going to, I'm waffling at the moment between vote men, vote yay. Um, like as an example of this style of argumentation, I don't think it's that bad. Like it knocked down all the things. And then, you know, at the end, it sort of, uh, you're going to get a nod grapes because that last argument pissed me off, which is unfair, but I'm angry. So they're getting a grapes. Shane says, I appreciate that they tried to look at it objectively, but I felt they were too convinced of their own objectivity. And that's why I just gave it the grapes. They tried to do that, and then they failed at the very end. That last argument was just sort of weak. Um, so it's like they petered out a little bit. Pr provocative thesis that's fun to discuss. Yeah, and that's also part of it. So they did a good job for that. So they're getting a brain dance too, because it was slightly fun, but like it really wasn't like I didn't think it was that fun, but the argument itself was fun. Like, I don't care, but like the argument itself was fun. So I'm giving it, let's see, and I'm going to give it, I'm still waffling on the meh or the yay. And there, you know, this actually, I'm not, I, I kind of like the paper. I, uh, they're going to get an Ouroboros. Uh, birth is, uh, pregnancy is an ancient idea. They, this does not always get brought up enough in philosophy, although it is in biomedical ethics. It's a major topic. But, like, uh, they deserve credit for writing on a, a big topic. So, yeah. And, uh... 
thinking. Vote meh, vote yay. But they're going to get a vote meh. Um, because they, uh, just to like situate it, um, you know, they're going to get a vote meh because it's going to be, they're, they didn't, they, they used a defaulting argument. I don't like that. They're just saying, look, because you, we don't have a good argument for it not being a disease. It is a disease. I don't love that stuff. I, I don't like those. And so they're getting a vote mad at me. Yep. 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 All right. So. Um, last 60 seconds, get your arguments in. But again, I thought there was a lot of good things. They talked about a lot of different um, arguments about pregnancy and how to view it. I thought they were pretty clear about them. Their examples weren't bad. They were okay. They Even when they hit a spot where there was some unusual fallacies with the statistical ones, they did a good job explaining what they thought was wrong about that. That, usually, that can go wrong quite often for people. I mean, I was saying Texas Sharpshooter. You guys can look that one up, but that's what it was. If you want to get tech uh, with the silly name about it. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it's a post hoc ergo propter hoc style fallacy. If you want the Latin fancy. 